Gail. Happy Sabbath. There's a lot of activity on our campus this morning, and we're just delighted that you're here. A big welcome to all of our guests, visitors, and those of you viewing online. Thank you so much for joining us here together this morning at the New Market Seventh day Adventist Church as we worship together. I just want to give a few quick announcements. There are many things on our program this morning wonderful music. And we want to enjoy this season together as we celebrate and remember the great gift of Jesus. At this time, I'm going to invite Gail Milkerson to come right to the front, and she'll pick up a microphone there, please, on your left side. <clears throat> you know, there's something very interesting that all of us have been supportive of as far as the Virginia Tax Credit Program. So, Gail, I, I trust you are a bearer of good news. I, I do. I do. I want to thank all of you that have given so generously to the Virginia Tax Credit Program over the last 10 years. Wow. This past year was a little bit of a challenge. You know, costs for everything has gone up. Some of our donors have moved out of state. Some have retired and don't give as much as usual. So it was a little bit of a tense year, but I can tell you that um, Almost $400,000 across the state of Virginia came in for the Virginia Tax Credit Program. A little less than usual, and I, there was a little bit of a nail biter right before the end of the year, and I was praying the very last day that you could give and get your money in the post office so it was stamped for 2023. I had two people that stepped forward one gave $300,000, I mean, I'm sorry, $30,000 and won $10,000 uh, for SVA at the very last day. Amen. So I just wanted to thank you all so much. And uh, if you would like to give this way, see me because uh, donors get a 65% Virginia tax credit. So if you give $1,000 and you get $650 back, that's a good deal. You can give that money twice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gail. I appreciate all that you do um, for that program because it does benefit our students right here on this campus, not only at the academy, but at the elementary school as well. Speaking of the elementary school, our principal, Davin Haven. I'm sorry, Davin Hammond. How are you doing, sir? Thank you. Okay, I'm glad you're close enough. <laughs> Tell us, I got to step back because otherwise, my microphone picks up your microphone. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's another beautiful morning. I know it's a little chilly still. We're enjoying the variety of weather in the spring. Um, Tuesday, April 30, um, all morning long, we are going to have a visitation day at SVAE. Now, people are welcome to come pretty much at any time if they line it up with Mrs. Reedy, but that's a special day we've set aside for visitors. And we're hoping to have a good group of visitors that day. Um, a couple notes you should notice. If they're in first grade or up, uh, you could just, as parents or grandparents or whatever, you can um, come just drop them off and they can stay the morning. But if they are younger than that, if they're preschool or kindergarten, we do ask that the parents stay with them. Um, and then lunch will be provided for, for the visitors and their families if they choose to, to stay for lunch. You're welcome to stay for lunch. So we'd love to have you come visit. Tell us the day again. April 30th, it's a Tuesday. Thank you so much. April 30th, Tuesday at SVAE Elementary School. Thank you, Principal Hammond. Just a little reminder, on April 14th, I think it has been scrolling on the screen, there will be a produce giveaway 
at 10 o'clock at the New Market Park. And we have done that, we did that last fall. Wonderful turnout. We're, we're able to just share the abundance with family and friends here in the New Market community. Tomorrow at 4, here in the Fellowship Hall, and I apologize, last week I said the Unlocking Daniel seminar would be at the Plains District Community Center, but that, that time tomorrow has been already booked by another group, so we're having our Daniel seminar here in the Fellowship Hall. That will be at 4 o'clock as we unlock Daniel chapter 9, one of the most incredible messianic promises that's found in the Bible. And this evening, at 7 o'clock, our guest pianist, Mary Grace, go ahead and just get at the piano and get ready, okay? Mary Grace will be here uh, with a special concert for us, 7 p.m., right here in the church. Again, I'm just grateful that you're here, all of our guests, visitors, family, and friends. And with the Psalter, let us declare, the earth is the Lord's and all the fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in, remembering the King of glory first. For he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures on the third day. So come, let us worship our crucified, risen, and soon coming King of glory. Amen.
I invite the congregation to stand as we have our invocation this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. We stand here before you in love and respect. For you alone are worthy of worship. For you give us life. Thank you. We admit, Lord, you are who we need. Our hearts are deceitful. Wrong looks right and dark looks light. We forget, we flounder, we fail. We are sorry. You are who we need. Do you still love us? Oh, please be merciful. Heal our hearts and mend our brokenness. Lift us into your presence. Deliver us from evil. Grow your love right here. We pray in the name of our hope, our Redeemer, our resurrection. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing. <clears throat> As our Pathfinder Color Guard enters and we sing together the patriotic hymn, America the Beautiful. colors. Ready? Face. Congregation, please be seated. Color guard, dismissed. I have standing next to me to our very own from the New Market Fire and Rescue Department, Clint, Nicole, and Grayson. By the way, when Clint came into church this morning, of all things, he thought I should recognize him because he went to flag camp. <laughs> I'm sorry that I didn't recognize you, Clint, but you look good. It's, it's been many years, Bob. Yes. On March 21st, Thursday, just 17 days ago, this picture that you're seeing on the screen was taken from our front porch. And all during that week, the forest fires could be seen burning up and over the Massanutten Mountains. I'm showing you these pictures this morning because many of our students and staff were on spring break. The campus was closed and they didn't see the smoke by day and the flames by night. High winds and a dry forest bed fueled the fire. On this side of the valley, we watched, we hoped, and we prayed for our first responders, firefighters, dispatchers, police, sheriff, medical personnel, 
and countless volunteers. We prayed. And this morning, as a campus community of faith, we want to let you know how much we appreciate all that you've done and continue to do. We are very blessed to have a group of dedicated men and women who keep our community safe from harm and danger. Thank you. I realize that this list is not complete, but on behalf of, <clears throat> on behalf of those within our church family who are close, closest to the fires, we say thank you. The Ricciardi family, the Turner family, the Phillip family, the Lorton family, the Pickett family, the White family, the Osborne family, the Menhart Miller family, the Croft family, the Barco family, the Bergen family, the Jetter family, the Paler family, Edith Sherrill, and Nancy Lou Cross, and many, many friends, we say thank you. And as a congregation, we affirm that you are responsible and conduct yourselves with integrity and give a positive example of the fire and first responder services. Thank you. And on behalf of the New Market Seventh day Adventist Church, I am honored to present a gift to you to the New Market Fire Department in appreciation for the service you give to our community and church. Thank you so much. You are loved. It would be very appropriate for us to give a prayer, prayer of blessing at this time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the service of our firefighters and first responders, the service that they give to our community. Please bless them with safety as they do their best to protect our valley and village from flame, flood, harm, and hurt. May we show support and love as they continue to serve. Bless their friendships and their families. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. As our honored guests return, Nicole is on duty, on call. Clint and Grayson have other things they must do this morning. But, oh, we wish you could stay for this beautiful music, but we want to send you off with beautiful music. Okay? Um, I invite all of us to sing the third stanza of America the Beautiful. It is most fitting for this occasion. Truly, our firefighters, police, and other first responders have acted in the most heroic way. And as we sing and they file out, let us give a thanksgiving wave of appreciation and love. All right, let us sing together.
Happy Sabbath, church family. Please continue standing and sing. <laughs> I had to catch you all. Please continue sing and standing and sing with us hymn 158, Were You There? Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Good morning, church family. Can you hear me? Oh, hello. Um, I would like to invite the children for the lamb offering, and as the children come up, I would like to ask the adults to generously give to our worthy student fund. Thank you. Good morning. I'm wondering if you can answer a question for me. When you grow up, if you could be anything, what would it be? Anybody? What? A veterinarian. A veterinarian. What would you like to be? A doctor. A doctor. We need lots of those. Anybody else? Yes. Um, a hygienist. A hygienist? A dental hygienist? A spaceman. A spaceman. Now that one sounds really good. Well, yes, one more. A teacher. A teacher. We need lots of those good ones too. I'm glad. Well, I didn't grow up to be this, but when I was about your age, what I really, really wanted to be was a test car driver. I bet you didn't know that about me. But I loved to drive cars, and a test car driver sounded exactly like what I wanted to be. And my dad, he always drove stick shifts. And a stick shift means that you tell the car what gear to be in. It's a little bit harder to drive. They don't have them around as much anymore. But I used to get to sit in the passenger seat when we would go out visiting, and he would let me shift from the passenger seat. And I loved driving. And so when I got older, I really, 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 really wanted a car. And my dad would say this, Stephanie, cars are holes you throw your money into. And so I didn't get a car. And I would say, Dad, but I really need a car. And I was in college, and I had all these wonderful things I wanted to do. And he'd say, Stephanie, trust me, cars are just holes you throw your money into. Well, one day, finally, I'd saved up enough of my money, and I worked really hard, and Dad said he'd help me with it, and he helped me to buy a car, and it was this little red car, and I loved the color red, and my sister named it Sparky. And Sparky and I were best friends, and Sparky was a stick shift, and Sparky and I drove everywhere, and I just loved Sparky. He was my best and favorite thing. Anytime I wanted to go do something good, I would go driving. It was my favorite thing to do. Well, there was one thing about Sparky. My dad ended up being a little bit correct. Sparky liked to have car trouble. 
Sparky had one thing that he did, and that was that he would do what they call hydroplane. So when it rained, my brakes would stop working sometimes. And so I ended up happening to total that car twice, which means I got in a really bad car accident twice. But I still love Sparky, even though it took a calcified um, paper towel to hold the headlight in. I still love Sparky, and he was my best friend, but he took all my money, and I had come back one day, and I was driving, and all of a sudden, Sparky did something really, really weird. He started flashing his lights and honking his horn, and I wasn't doing that. And what happens when you flash your lights and honk your horn? What do other people on the road think? I'm what? I'm drunk? <laughs> yeah, that could be one of them. That's definitely true. Something's not right. They're not happy with me. That was a good answer. They're going, what's wrong? Because when you honk, what does that mean? You're in my way, or I'm mad at you, and if I'm flashing my lights, I'm really mad, right? And I thought, Sparky, what's going on? We can't be telling people we're mad at them. We're fine. Everything's fine. And people were looking around at me, and he was honking his horn and flashing his lights. That's kind of weird. Cars don't just do that. Well, it was several weeks, and Sparky hadn't done it again, and I'd forgotten about it. Until one night, I was driving back to my dorm room at college, and all of a sudden, as I came over the hill, Sparky started doing it again. Now, at night, when lights flash, it's even bigger. And we were in a spot where you had to go really slow, where the police always got you. And my car started honking its horn and flashing its lights at the person in front of them. And what do you think they thought? They weren't happy. They were wondering why I was so upset behind them, and I couldn't tell them anything else. And I didn't know what was going on. I said, Sparky, I just took you in. You've taken all my money. I can't take you in again. I don't know what's wrong. And they're never going to believe me that my car is just randomly honking its horn and flashing its lights. And I don't know what to do. Well, I realized something that night is the other thing. It was doing a third thing. You know what the third thing it was doing? My doors were unlocking and locking as well when it would do this. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know what's going on. So I thought, you know, when I lock my car, it does all of that. So maybe it thinks I'm trying to lock my doors. Maybe my key is hitting the side as, it's, as I'm driving. So I started trying to hit the thing to see if I could get it to do it again. And I called my dad and I said, I don't know what to do. Sparky's doing this and it's really embarrassing. And I don't know what to do about it because people are thinking I'm mad at them. And I tried everything and I prayed. I was like, Jesus, please help me. This is really embarrassing. And I don't have more money to fix Sparky. He's taken all of my money. And it didn't happen for a few days until one final time I was sitting at a stoplight at a very busy intersection when all of a sudden Sparky went crazy. He was honking his horn and flashing his lights and locking the doors and all kinds of things all at the same time and we're all at a stoplight, nobody can move and my car is honking. And what did I think to do? I was like, no, 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 it's fine. Well, I realized what does that mean if I'm going like this? What do you think they thought? They thought I was even more mad because now I'm and I'm honking my horn and flashing my lights at them. And they thought, oh, and I just wanted to sink down in my seat. And I was so embarrassed. Have you ever said anything that you didn't mean to say? And you didn't know how to take it back? Yeah, I see some heads. Maybe you know how I felt. Sometimes things come out of our mouths and it's not really what we mean. And then we try to fix it and somebody thinks that we're even more mad than we meant to. Or we said something even more hurtful and we're like, where did that come from? Yeah. Well, finally the light turned green. And as we took off, Sparky kept honking and flashing. And finally he stopped. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to get this fixed. I'm going to have to go in. I don't have money. But something is wrong with Sparky. And this is really embarrassing. Well, that night I was laying in bed. And I was just thinking, God, please help me. I don't know what to do. This is really embarrassing. And I need to fix Sparky. And I don't want people to think that I'm mad at them on the road because I'm not. And I could cause an accident while I'm doing all this stuff that I'm not trying to do in my car. And then something came into my head. I told you I'd taken Sparky in to get fixed not too many weeks before. And the guy told me over the phone, I'm going to take your other spare key and I'm going to put it under the rug in your car. And that key had a button on it to unlock and lock my doors. And so when I was moving my feet in the car, my foot was stomping on the key and locking the doors. And that's what was happening with Sparky. I went out and I pulled the rug up and sure enough, there was my key and I pulled it out and I said, that's what's wrong with you. And I didn't have to even spend any money to fix it. 
It was really good. And my car stopped honking and being embarrassing. There is a verse in the Bible. It's in Psalms 119, and it's a song, and I would love for you to sing it with me. And it goes like this. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. That I might not sin, that I might not sin, thy word have I hid in my heart. We can hide a lot of things in our heart. Everything that we do during the day, it goes inside of us, and it hides down in our heart. The things that we do, the people that we talk to, and sometimes those things can go into our heart, and they cause hurt or anger or things that upset us, don't they? And then sometimes they can come out. What's hidden deep down inside can come out, and it can be really embarrassing, just like what happened with Sparky. But you know what? The more time we spend with Jesus, the more he gets hidden in our heart. And when we hide Jesus in our heart, what comes out? No, not that. Who comes out? When, when we hide Jesus in our heart, who comes out? Jesus comes back out. So if you're struggling and maybe you're having trouble saying things you don't want to say to other people, or maybe you're feeling really angry, go and spend some time with Jesus and hide him down in your heart. Because when we do, Jesus comes back out and we can share Jesus and good things with others. You can go back to your seats. Good morning, church family. Will the ushers please come forward? The offering this morning is for our local church budget. Each gift will go in support of the many ministries of our campus church. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord's glorious name. Bring an offering and come into his temple. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Sabbath. I ask that you bless this offering and the people and the ministries that will receive it. Help it to be a blessing. And in my prayer, amen.
Good morning, church family. Aren't you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Today, our scripture reading is found in Philippians 3, 8 through 11. I will be reading from the ESV version, Philippians 3, 8 through 11. And it reads, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I invite all of you that can to kneel with me for a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we welcome you this morning here in the church, and we welcome you to our hearts. We want to know you better. We want to know the power of your resurrection. We want to be in Christ, and we want to be ready for your soon returning. Please be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church family. Good morning, church family. Thank you, thank you. I hope you still have your Bibles in hand and on the verse because to start off this segment of the service, we're going to be going through and truly diving into what this verse really means. Um, again, if you don't, lost it, it's Philippians 3, starting at verse 8. Of course, that verse means... Hold on. No, wait, I know this, trust me. Um... We just read it. It was really powerful. It was, um, oh, man. Hold on. Don't worry. I have a backup plan. I'll just read it. Let's find out. <clears throat> Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Hold on. Count, gain, worth, loss. Guys, I know what we're talking about. Don't worry. I, have, I solved it. We are talking about personal finance. Shout out Mr. Shu, Ramsey Classroom. Come on now. Seniors, you know what we're talking about. It's obvious. Paul here is talking about net worth and budgeting, right? He's figuring out, assessing, calculating how much his assets are worth, and then he's putting them against, comparing them to the one thing, that one thing that it speaks of in the Bible. Paul says that he's willing to give up everything for that one thing. That is not what we learn in personal finance. Give up everything for one thing? Every Whoa, guys, guys, this is much bigger than Ramsey's classroom. Guys, this is life or death. This is everything. This is, this is the entire truth. This is what we are here on earth for. This is what truly matters. This one thing, or more accurately said, this one person. This is what we are here for. Now, those of us who budget and do our little budgets to make sure we're on our monthly payroll and make sure we're getting our taxes in and, you know, things like that, we know that budgeting can be very confusing at times. You know, a lot of moving parts, a lot of complexities, sometimes the water bill is high, you know, things like this. But don't worry, I'll make it extremely simple for you. If we lose Christ, we lose everything. But if we gain Christ, we gain everything. We may be wondering what it means. What does it look like to gain everything? How do I apply that? What does that truly mean? These are just words. Let's go back to the scripture and see if it can tell us. Starting again at verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing 
Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Here's the key. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Do you know Jesus? Do you know the power of the resurrection? I hope you do, because that power of the resurrection has the power to bring us from our old simple, sinful life into life eternal. Our message today is going to be brought to us through the songs, through the readings, through the retelling of the story. In your bulletins, there is a white paper. Thank you, Biagi. That paper is the guide. It is the blueprint to the service. It's going to tell you lead you along so you know the theme and what we're trying to tell you. But I challenge you, it may look like a, a child's quest, but even you adults, I challenge you to use it, personalize it, make it your own. Because our relationship with Christ is more than just knowing what the words are, understanding the songs, though the hymns and scripture are good, it's knowing and having a personal relationship with him each and every day. So my prayer for each and every one of us is that we may grow a little bit closer to Christ today. Know him a little bit more. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just let
precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. These are the titles ascribed to Jesus. And we can find many more names of Jesus in the Bible, such as Redeemer, The Way, The Truth, Breath of Life, Lion of Judah, Cornerstone, Savior. These names and these words have meaning. Sometimes we use the words without stopping to think about what we are actually saying. But if we really want to know Jesus, we should pay attention to what the Bible says and the meanings these words have. And there are concepts, not just words, but concepts we need to understand. What is a cross? When you see a cross, what do you think of? Some churches have steeples with crosses at the top, or they make a cross the centerpiece of their platform. What does the cross represent? Why don't we have it? Maybe you know that someone died on a cross a long time ago. So what? How does that impact us today? What did the cross mean to Jesus? Well, I can try to answer that. I was one of the followers of Jesus. We spent time following him throughout Judea. We saw him preaching words with power like no one else could. We saw him heal the sick. We saw the joy that he brought to families, and we even saw him heal the dead and raise them up. We had no doubt that he was the one, the Messiah. And when we went to Jerusalem, we were prepared to crown him king. Oh, there was such excitement. We were ready, but not ready for the cross. You see, a cross has different meanings, but for us Jews that were not really free, the cross was a constant symbol and reminder that we were under the dominion of another kingdom that was stronger than us. We, as a people, were slaves in Egypt, but God, he worked wonders and he took our people out. Mm. He did that with his strong hands. We went through the wilderness and to the promised land. God gave us this land, but then, because of our unfaithfulness, we were brought into captivity and scattered everywhere. After a long time, we were able to come back to our promised land. And then we were sure that the Holy One would come and we would be free forever. But the Romans, they were much, much more powerful kingdom. They were rude, they were ruthless, violent, and they liked to see the people suffer that they conquered. They were relentless and they had no mercy. Although, yes, they let us have our religion and abide by it only, only if we acknowledge them and we recognize that they were superior and paid them tribute. So they put out crosses outside of many, many cities with people hanging there to die. So they didn't kill them all at once. They had them there to suffering so that everyone could know and be reminded that they were in power. And they used crucifixion as a supreme punishment. And crucifixion, it was not conducted in a cell to seem just terror in a cell. No, it was made public. Public as a skeptical to be seen by a public audience. And for us Jews, for everyone, the cross, it was ultimately a symbol that showed that we were not free. All the suffering, it went on everywhere. For the people hanging, for the people watching, the families, the visitors that were traveling along, everyone is affected by the cross. There's no way, no word, no way to describe what the cross means, what the cross was. And Jesus, he went to the cross for you and for me. It was in Gethsemane that Jesus prayed and surrendered his life unto the Father. Then the soldiers arrived with torches and took him away All to face the biggest test of his life He showed his love He bore our suffering Oh, he took up our cross by man come see the tears in 
his eyes it was only for you that Jesus did show such great love and the soldiers came and spied in Jesus' face and above all the multitude he Deep. 
changed everything, and Jesus changed the meaning of the cross. It was once a symbol of suffering, sins, kings, the kingdom of sin's reign on earth is now a symbol of God's kingdom. What was once, a, was once brought suffering now brings healing. What once brought shame now brings hope. What one, mm, well, now brings hope, excuse me. What once brought death, a gruesome death to a few, now offers all eternal life. I personally am willing to give him my all, give him my everything. You might be wondering why. Why would I do such a thing? Why would I give everything I have to someone I can't even see? Well, let me tell you why. Because I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Holy One, God's Son, Emmanuel, God with us. He is who it is said in Isaiah, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there shall be no end. To establish and to uphold it on the, on the throne of David and of his kingdom from this time forth and forevermore. The God of our fathers will do this. The kingdom of God is here, has come, and is here. And is only here and is only available to us because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because he died for us.
Good morning. My name is Mary Magdalene. I am also a follower of Jesus. Oh, he did so many things for me. I can't even mention one as most important because he's done so many miracles in my life. Now, he is my rabbi. Notice I am saying he is and not he was. I know we were just remembering that he died on the cross and how that is the ultimate demonstration of his fatherly love for us. He told us many times, little children, my father loves you. Don't worry. And so many kind words that filled our hearts and gave us hope. But then we saw him walk the shameful way and die as the worst sinner. And he didn't save himself, although he knew he could save himself just as he had saved others and how he saved me. So I couldn't believe that he was dead. After all the hope he had given me, there was still a small glimmer that my Savior wasn't dead, but risen. So on Sunday morning, I ran to the place where we had buried him. But when I got there, the stone had been, the stone had been rolled away and the tomb empty. I didn't know what happened to my Savior, nor what to do. My heart shattered. I ran out of the tomb and began looking for anyone who could tell me where my Savior was. Did someone arrive before me to give him the proper burial he deserved? Not any, as I went back to the tomb, someone appeared to me. Not one of the disciples, for they were too frightened to enter the tomb. I hung my head down and said, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have laid him and I will go. You see, in the tomb I had spoken to angels who told me that Jesus was no longer dead, but living. Now outside I was talking to him, but I was blinded to that reality until he said my name, Mary. Then I recognized his voice, I recognized his love. I clung to him so tightly I didn't want to let go of him ever again. Oh, he was alive, he is alive. He did everything he came to do. You see, on the cross, he came because he fulfilled the plan that he and the Father have created to save us from condemnation and death. See how our Father loves us.
Hallelujah. Christ the Lord is recent. And it's recent today. I hope you were following the lyrics and written, you should be on the back page. And it, in the middle of it there, I want to invite you to, to follow it. It says, the work is, and this is a blank. What should it come over there? The work of our salvation is done. That's what Jesus said, right? It is finished. And we can sing and praise the Lord for that. So the work is done, but Jesus is not dead. Jesus has risen. He is alive. And that's why we are here singing. His resurrection is the proof. It's the proof that his kingdom is here and his kingdom will last forever. That's the proof. So it, there is nothing, Paul says, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That was on, on the song that we play with the humbles. Jamás podrá alguien separarnos. It means that. Nothing, never, nothing will be able to separate us from God now. Because everything that Jesus did. But now, if we only remember the, the cross, so the cross without the resurrection will be condemning you. Because if Jesus only died and never resurrected, Paul says, no, pity of us if we only believe that Jesus came and died and that's all. So if, if the cross is not accompanied, it's not accompanied by the resurrection, it's condemning us. Still, we are still under another kingdom, another power. And also, if we only remember the resurrection, if Jesus came and died and then resurrected and went home and nothing else happened, do we have any hope? That would be just shameful for us because he saved himself. He went back home to heaven and we don't have any other hope. So, the cross without the resurrection is meaningless, but the resurrection without what? The resurrection without the second coming is only, it's also meaningless. If we only believe that that happened in the past and we are now waiting for something else to happen, then we are doomed, aren't we? Of course, that's not true, right? That, that's not what is happening. And that's thank, thanks to God. Is not depending on us. He didn't depend on us for coming and dying for us, for resurrecting, and he's not depending on us for coming back. But he is coming back, and he wants to take us home. And we, wanted, we didn't want to finish this remembering of all that Jesus did without a glimpse of heaven. We need to focus our eyes on what Jesus did, but also on what he's about to do for us. He's still doing right now in heaven, and he will complete it. I've seen here, uh, is, is Florin here? Florin? Yeah, he's here. He's my friend, Florin here. You know him? You know Florin? When we came here, we came here to the valley like seven years ago, and he was uh, trying to get a house for us, right? That's what, what Florin does, right? And he say, um, he's always telling some jokes, right? You know him? Yeah, is that Florin? So he say, oh, well, you don't, you, you don't know the place here. This is beautiful. And he say, you know what West Virginia says? Almost heaven. That's, that's the slogan for West Virginia. You know what he says? The West Virginia is almost heaven because we are here in Virginia, so we are in heaven. That's what he told me. So we are in a beautiful place, thanks to the Lord, right? But this is not our home. We need to have a, a glimpse of, of heaven and be ready because he's coming to take us home. I have fixed my mind on another time, on another time, and 
here I mean and stand to stand until Father in heaven, you show us your love long time ago, 
and you show it, you show every day your love to us. And you show us also a glimpse of heaven. We can see it in your word and your, in your miracles every day for us. Please help us to be ready. Help us to set our minds and our hearts in you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been mightily blessed to be here this morning. My heart goes out with a big thanks to the Biagis and to Ms. Wiedemann and to all of our students. You are allowing Jesus to use our t your talents to glorify Him. I want to invite all of you just to remain seated for our postlude. And for those of you who have joined us online, thank you so much. God has blessed us abundantly this morning. Let us carry his blessing of hope and love in our hearts as we face this new week. God bless you.